Thanks very much for coming along. I don't know if everyone likes to take a seat. Uh, so thank you very much for coming back to the Manchester Space Union this week. Uh, this week's event is on the motion of this house would reintroduce grammar schools. And I'll introduce your speakers, I'll do some various announcements, and then uh, tell you about the structure of tonight's debate, and then we'll get started. So, on the side proposition for this motion, we have to my right, Robert McCartney QC, who's a barrister, former leader of the UK Unionist Party, and chairman of the National Grammar Schools Association. And with him, we have Graham Brady MP, Conservative MP for the Altrium and Sale West, um, and former Shadow Secretary for Europe, and chairman of the 1922 Committee. A big round of applause. To my left, on the side of opposition, we have Melissa Ben, um, who's a campaigner and writer, founder of the Local Schools Network, and chairperson of Comprehensive Future. And with her, we have Professor Bernard Barker, um, who's the Emeritus Professor of Educational Leadership and Management at the University of Leicester, and the first comprehensive school pupil to become a comprehensive head teacher in the UK. A big round of applause. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the major political parties presently face a period of radical change. The suggested reason given by the commentators is that their remoteness from both the fears and hopes of the electorate is the main reason. Metropolitan elite, public school cliques are some of the pejorative terms used to characterise politicians who patronise the voters and their expressed opinions on a range of issues, including, curiously enough, selective education. Such politicians, after all, know best, or perhaps they just think they know best. Diane Ravitch, a world-renowned authority on education, once declared the purpose of education systems is to educate. It is not the advancement of some social, political, or ideological objective. In contrast, Tony Crossman, the Labour Education Minister in 1967, launched his attack on grammar schools by declaring, if it is the last thing I do, I'm going to destroy every fucking grammar school in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. He singularly failed in Northern Ireland. When asked by his researchers, and here's the punch, if they could evaluate the relative merits of selective and comprehensive education, his reply was no. That is a matter of political, not educational judgment. Since then, education has been increasingly cursed by political and social engineering in pursuit of electoral and ideological objectives. The Butler reforms of 1944, which offered every child an equal opportunity of a grammar school education on merit, and which has proved to be the most effective vehicle for upward social mobility, was to be replaced by the Marxist dogma of equality of results or outcome. Upon this, the comprehensive system with its non-selective all-ability admission was founded. Whatever the noble ideals of the comprehensive system, it has in practice over the last 50 years proved to be, in general terms, an educational disaster for a great number of children, and particularly for able children from disadvantaged areas. There are, of course, a number of excellent comprehensives of these, the vast majority are in areas of affluence, and all of which have become, in real terms, selective. Not on merit, but on the basis of class and house price. Lord Adonis, later a Labour Minister of Education, a Labour Minister, wrote in 1998, and I quote, The comprehensive revolution tragically destroyed much of the excellent without improving the rest. Comprehensive schools have largely replaced selection by ability with selection by class and house price. Houses in the catchment areas of a good comprehensive can command a premium of up to £100,000. 
In the three quarters of England, where there are none of the remaining 164 grammar schools, the situation is most acute. It is the children of poorer parents who are most disadvantaged. Without financial resources, their only option for their bright and able child is the nearest, perhaps poorly performing comprehensive. For decades, successive governments, either ideologically driven as on the left, or electorally fearful of being labelled elitist on the right, have adopted a variety of deceptions to disguise the ongoing decline in the quality of state education and in the process denying parental choice. The 1998 Labour Education Act expressly prohibits the opening of any new grammar school and Mr Cameron has made no effort to repeal it. Let me give you a list of the methods of disguise to cover the defects in an all-embracing comprehensive system. The dumbing down of public examinations, the increasing generosity in the market of papers, the inclusion of subjects of questionable academic merit, the system of modules which did not always reflect the pupil's own effort, the number of resets to attain a higher grade. All of these disguised the fact that the system was failing. For politicians and ministers, the quality of state education was not objective evaluation. It was a matter, as Tony Croswell had told us, told his researchers, of political judgment. In educational terms, the banning of new grammar schools is an outrage. Any objective evaluation of results illustrates the point. Figures provided in Parliament by a Labour minister showed that 164 grammar schools achieved the same number of A and B grades in the difficult subjects, physics, chemistry, maths, modern languages, as 1,500 comprehensives. The much maligned secondary moderns had a national average of 42.3 pupils achieving five GCSE A star to C, including English and Maths, while some totally comprehensive areas, like Bristol, with 18 comprehensives, were achieving only 35.1. Let me perhaps explain what is the solution to this, and Northern Ireland points the way. It is no independent schools, only grammars and secondary moderns, the number of grammar school places makes them available to children of all social classes, with 40% of post-primary children going to grammar schools. Pupils at <coughs> primary schools are, if their parents wish, uh, coached, if you like, for the selective tests, and this has reduced the whole issue of privately paid for coaching. Pupils at secondary moderns can transfer to grammar schools after GCSE if the results justify it. As a consequence, Northern Ireland has for many years enjoyed the best GCSE and A-level results in the United Kingdom. But more importantly, it sends a higher proportion of pupils from the lower income groups to universities than the mainland's allegedly more egalitarian comprehensives. May I conclude by saying this on a personal note? I was born in 1936, the height of the Depression, in a back street in Belfast, the youngest of eight children. My father was a labourer, my mother was a linen mill worker. The Butler reforms offering equality of opportunity on merit enabled me to go to a local LEA grammar school, from there to university, from there to the bar, 27 years as a Queen's Council, and ultimately, perhaps to my discredit, to the House of Commons as an independent member. I owe everything I have ever achieved to a grammar school education. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite Professor uh, Bernard Barker to open the case of side for opposition. The proposers of this motion are arguing, as I understand it, that selection is an unequivocal good. I think that's the phrase of Graham Brady's. 
He's not shaking his head against me. So I think that's the phrase, that selection is an unequivocal good and will promote social mobility, especially for working class students who are disadvantaged and particularly by the present system, I guess. I believe that this represents the result of selective experiences on the part of the proposers of the motion and a selective memory that involves eliminating most educational history. Uh, let me tell you about the people who failed the 11 class, friends of mine, many of them, who didn't get to grammar school, who had to go on a second or a third chance, whose whole careers have been blighted by the experience of failure. 80% failed the 11 class. This was a social evil that was eliminated. Do we want to go back to it? What grammar schools actually were was a bottleneck. They selected the top 20% and then got really appalling results from them. So, for example, in 1959, 40% of the students failed to get more than three ordinary levels, the equivalent of GCSE to the higher grade today. Only 3% of the people at grammar schools who got two A levels, only 3% came from working class backgrounds. The variation in recruitment across the country, this to me was one of the worst scandals of it, varied, selected for grammar school Marionetshire, 64%, Gateshead, 8%. So the postcode lottery that people worry about today was nothing on the regional lottery that prevailed in the grammar school days. We've also forgotten the research that was done when the grammar schools were in their golden age. Jackson and Marsden's book, I recommend it to education students, it may seem a bit arcane for everybody else, but they describe what they saw as the colossal waste of talent of working class students in that system. Why did they say that? Vast amount of statistical research. You were less likely, by a huge margin, to be selected for a grammar school if you were working class. You were much less likely to do well, especially if you were a girl, and you were much, much less likely to go to university. Working class children did not do well under the grammar school system. If you doubt the class bias, look at the Crowther report on early leaving from school. They found, by studying the entrance to national service, which some of you probably hardly even heard of, military service for young people, entrance, 75% of the middle class entrance had been to a grammar school, and 85% of the working class entrance had been to a secondary model. Doesn't sound like much social mobility going on to me, sounds like social reproduction going on. In the golden age of social mobility, when all these wonderful opportunities opened, I'm picking 1963 because that's when the Robbins report recommending the expansion of higher education came about. The total in any form of higher education, including teacher training colleges, which were then quite a big part of the higher education offer, there were 216,000 people in the entire country entering and serving in all those forms of higher education. In 2011, it's 1,300,000. Now, whatever's wrong with comprehensive education, whatever failures, and there are plenty of them, plenty of poor schools, plenty of disappointments, whatever you may say, it has not stopped an enormous increase in the number of young people going on to higher education. The sixth form, the opening up of sixth form education is the key to that, more important than the comprehensive schools, actually. It meant that ordinary people could stop on at school and find their way through the system. Under the grammar school system, there was no sixth form for secondary modern students. There was no second chance unless they applied and got into a grammar school. So not much doubt that comprehensive zone, massive new opportunities, especially for women. For the women here today, I just say to you, 
When I went to university in the 1960s, women were a small minority of those. In my university, Cambridge, there were three women's colleges and 20 plus for men. Today, women are more than half of the students. I believe that the opening of opportunity through comprehensive schools and the expansion of higher education has been good for female opportunities and has been good for working class opportunities. What grammar schools did, and I don't deny that many people had a fine education in grammar schools. They were bright, on the whole, middle class kids who did well and had good teaching and did go on to university. They were a tiny minority. The system failed all the rest, and without doubt they failed the 80% who didn't go. <coughs> why, I ask now, in drawing this to a close, why should it be different a second time around? I want to end by saying, is it selection an unequivocal good? You'll hear from our opponents what was good about it, let me tell you what's bad about selection and those of you who perhaps have attended selective schools, do you recognise any of this? If you go to a selective school and you only meet other selected people, how good is your sense of yourself and where you fit into the social order? If you're in a selective school with a smart blazer and an esteemed halo hangs about you, how do you feel about the people who didn't get in? How do you feel about the people on the streets? Do you develop, perhaps, a sense of entitlement? A sense of your own self-worth that puts you in a different pedestal? And of course, the I may say this, I'm not preaching <coughs> comprehensive schools for other people. I went to a comprehensive school, my children went to comprehensive schools. I wouldn't have wished a competitive, pressurised, high-performance examination on my children, and I wouldn't wish it for other people. Finally, the, the narrow academic goals of education, all those subjects that aren't really worthwhile. Let, let, is that the final bell? I'll stop on that point and ask you to oppose the motion. Thank you. listen to you, we heard a lot about what grammar schools and selective education were like in the 1950s. We heard a lot about what they were like in the 1960s. We heard uh, from Bernard about the failure of too many secondary modern schools in those decades. And we heard, didn't we, about how terribly unfair it was for the majority of children not going to grammar schools in those decades. Uh, I have uh, a problem in this uh, debate because not only did I go to a grammar school, Altrium Grammar School, which is a very fine school and a better school today than it was when I was a boy there, uh, I also, uh, having benefited from the opportunities that I was given in the Trafford Grammar School system, uh, become the Member of Parliament uh, for part of the borough of Trafford. So I'm afraid, Bernard, my problem is that I know what the system's like now. I know what it's like today. And what we did in Trafford and the places where we have kept selection was use a little bit of logic and a little bit of common sense. <laughs> if in the 1950s and the 1960s the problem was that the grammar schools were succeeding they were providing the social opportunity that Bernard talked about. Uh, and, the, and the problem was the failure of the secondary models. You're all educated people here. What would you do? Would you get rid of the bit of the system that worked? Or would you get rid of the bit of the system that didn't? So what we've done in Trafford, what we've done in my constituency, is raise the standard of the secondary models. We call them high schools. In Northern Ireland, they've done the same where the attainment in those high schools is superb. So I say to Bernard, he talked about a golden age of grammar schools. For those of us 
who are fortunate in, enough still to have grammar schools, the golden age is now. It's a golden age for selection. When you are selecting the right pupil to go to the right school, and everyone gets to go to an excellent school. And yes, people going to the very good high schools in my constituency have smart blazers too, I'm pleased to say, and they don't feel that they are consigned to failure uh, when they go to a school like Wellington, which gets better results than most of the honorability comprehensive schools in Leafia, Cheshire, nearby. So, yes, I believe, because of my own experience, I know that if I had stayed in Salford where I was born, my opportunities would have been dramatically less than they were because my parents moved to Timberley when I was four years old. I happened to have the benefits of the selective system as Robert did and he told you about too. Um, fundamentally, I believe in the system because it works. It's not about ideology, it's not about uh, some rose-tinted view of the past. It's looking at a system that delivers. And if you look year in, year out, at the authorities which are at the top of the league tables, you find that eight out of 10 of the best <coughs> local education authorities in the country are either selective or are partially selective. If you look at the results for every single ethnic minority group in the country, all do better in selective systems, not in comprehensive systems. But there's no mystery in this. Almost everybody now in education recognizes that it is better to teach by ability. It's easier to focus on a smaller part of the ability range. The question is, uh, do you do it by banding and streaming and setting within schools, or can you do it also <coughs> between schools? It seems to work better when you do it uh, between schools. We've got decades of evidence now showing it. Now, I do believe, fundamentally, that education should be about extending the opportunities for everybody, regardless of where they start in life. And if you look at what has happened over the last few decades, as we've seen the retreat from selective education and more concentration in comprehensives, you see a woeful backward step in social mobility. In 1971, of the 21 permanent secretaries of Whitehall departments, the people who really run government, not the politicians, four of them, <coughs> went to public school. All of the others were educated in grammar schools. Uh, since then, if you look at the Sutton Trust research, you see the way that the public schools, the independent schools, are reasserting their dominance in the civil service, in the professions, and in politics. Evidence in the newspapers today from the Sutton Trust looking at the candidates for parliament, looking at the way in which increasingly independent education is coming to dominate our democratic institutions too. Half of the Conservative candidates in winnable seats were independently educated. And that's a party which had leaders for many years, uh, from Ted Heath and Margaret Thatcher and John Major, who have been educated in the state sector. 31% of all of the candidates of all parties likely to win come from independent schools. That's 7% of the population independently <coughs> educated. And if you look at the evidence of social selection, are these opportunities open to everyone, or is it better, as Bernard says, in comprehensive systems? The Sutton Trust looked at the most socially selective schools in the country. 91 of the most socially selective 100 schools in this country are comprehensive schools. Uh, they are selecting by house price, they're selecting by social class, they're not selecting by ability. And recently, we saw research on the best local authorities in the country for getting people into Russell Group universities like <coughs> this one. And there is only one local authority in that top 20 list that comes from anywhere outside the south of England. Across the whole of the North and the Midlands, the only authority is mine, Selective Trafford. Ladies and gentlemen, it works, and we should give people that opportunity. Thank you. Thanks very much, Graham. I invite Melissa to continue the case of side opposition.
first of all, can you hear me? I don't see. Can you hear me? You have to say yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. One of the problems about speaking last is that one gets so infuriated and interested by one's opponent's comments that I had to completely tear up the speech I made and um, answer a lot of what they say. Um, so you'll uh, forgive me if I occasionally stop and look at the notes I've been scribbling. First thing I want to say is I'm delighted to be here, but I'm dismayed that 50 years after we moved towards a comprehensive system, which has been a tremendously problematic because a lot of people in politics, not least all those independently educated politicians in the Tory party and maybe even the Labour party have a problem with it, we are still discussing this same issue. Let me say three quick things about the history because Bernard has dealt with it. The evidence is absolutely clear. Robert McCartney may have done well at a grammar school. I salute his personal experience. Selective education on the whole did not serve working class children well, even for many of those who won places at them. Secondly, all the evidence on social mobility, if you read John Goldthorpe, who is the expert on social mobility, he says it is not to do with education. There were um, employment opportunities opened in the post-war period and there was more opportunity for people to move into professional and managerial jobs. And Philip Collins of the Times, who is no supporter of conferences, has said definitively, looking at all the evidence, it is nothing to do with our education system. Thirdly, I would remind Graham Brady that if he wants to bring back selective education on a national scale, it was Tory voters and angry Tory parents who, in the end, finished the system off. I quote Simon Jenkins, a journalist, when he said that Edward Boyle, the Tory Minister of Education in the 1960s, was torn limb from limb by angry parents whose children were rejected and were sent to the secondary moderns. So that's the three points about the history. I have to take issue with Graham's view that secondary moderns and grammars are considered equal. I take issue with the idea that children are different. I actually agree with Michael Gove that all children should have a rigorous academic education in as much as they can, up to 16, and then you specialise. So I think this idea, I've, I've looked at Graham's, made some lovely videos about Trafford, and he goes to Altrim, his old school, and then he goes to Wellington, the secondary modern, and I felt uneasy about it. And I know that I, as a child, would not have been happy to be sent to a secondary modern to be told to do more practical and artistic things, and I would not be happy for my children to have been sent there either. The other thing that none of us have said is it's not just about failure, and it is about failure. At the heart of selection, it's a policy about telling 10-year-olds and 11-year-olds that they failed. That's why you mustn't reverse your original view and bring and support this motion. But um, it is about failure. But all, yeah, So that's a very important thing. It's about designating a lot of people second best. And all the evidence of people who have failed the 11 plus, and some very famous and clever people have failed the 11 plus, it's all nonsense, that was what I was going to say, that people change. The person you are at 11, the things you know at 11, you might develop at 15 or 16, but you have been told, before you've reached puberty, that you're not, you're different, to use Graham Brady's term. Now, I think the support of selective education now, and again, I have to quarrel with Graham Brady, Trafford is an unusual place, it is relatively well off, and it gets good results because well off areas get good results. And actually, the prior attainment into that secondary modern Wellington is very high for any part around the country. But look at selection, the 15 selective areas generally. This year, thousands of children will sit the 11 plus and thousands will fail. I feel ashamed that I live in a country where we still do that. But if you look around at those selective authorities, the ones who are failing are poorer children. Nationally, in grammar schools, there's about 3% of children on free school meals, which is an approximate indicator. In other state schools, there is 17%, and actually I read a report today said it was 28%. There's a real imbalance there. And the Financial Times did a detailed and definitive analysis of selective education. They found good results in Trafford, unsurprising, given that it's relatively well off. But they said, absolutely unequivocally, poor, ch poor children do dramatically worse in selective areas. Now look, all education policy in this country is now focused on improving the education of poor children. That's what Michael Gove was all about. I have huge problems with Michael Gove, but he was passionate about that. And the way to do that is to continue the comprehensive revolution and to make it better. And nobody would say that there weren't mistakes. I think Anthony Crossland is absolutely irrelevant. What some publicly educated Labour minister said 50 years ago about ruining the fucking grammar schools is nothing to do with the effort of thousands and thousands of 
people today, including Teach First, including all of us, to make our comprehensive schools really good. Robert McCartney is also wrong to say that the only good comprehensives are in rich areas. If you go to somewhere like Town Hamlets, you go to Mulberry School, which I've spoken at some of their events, two thirds of those girls are on free school meals, with 79% of them part get to five good A to C GCSEs, you know that marker. 89% of them go to university. That is what our modern education system is about moving towards and that's what we have to support, not to go back to this failed policy that is going to increase inequality and anyway parents aren't going to put up with it, I'm going to tell Graham Brady now, he's going to have people tearing him limb from limb and he looks much too nice to have that happen to him. <laughs> and the, the other thing I would say is internationally, Andrew Schleicher, who is the global supremo, Michael Gove called him the most important man in, in English education, although he's the head of the OECD, he said only this week, it was very kind of him as we were having this debate, he said that this idea that equality and excellence can, um, equality and excellence can't coexist is again totally old fashioned. The top performing systems in the world, from Finland to Japan, Singapore to Hong Kong, are comprehensive in intake. And what they do is work really hard to raise standards for all. You also mentioned Diane Ravitch. Diane Ravitch has not been brought into your case. Diane Ravitch believes in really good local state schools. And it doesn't mean you can't have academic excellence. We know around the country, lots of children go to comprehensives, they go through, they go to Oxbridge, they go to universities like this. It's just nonsense to say that you can't do well in a comprehensive, but it doesn't mean that we don't have to keep working. My final point is, you mentioned about Trafford. I don't, we must be looking at different evidence, and that's politics, isn't it? You use your evidence, I use mine. But I was looking at the top 20 boroughs in terms of performance. <coughs> And actually London boroughs, which are not well off, which are not drawing on the better off of, of Trafford, are now among the 20 highest performing authorities in the country. So I'm here to tell you that if we keep working at it, comprehensive education can work and it will benefit all of us. Do not support this motion. Thank you. combination question, but I try and answer it. Um, obviously, uh, I think most people would accept that uh, pure maths, physics, chemistry, and modern languages are much more difficult than a lot of other subjects on the GCSE or A level list. I certainly would, and I think most objective people would. And what I'm simply saying is that the grammar schools had a unique quality. They matched the brightest children with the best teachers. For example, take physics. In the comprehensive schools in the London Education Authority, 35% of the schools didn't offer physics, comprehensive schools, offer physics at all. Why? Because only four or five children in the upper sixth were taking them and they couldn't afford to have a teacher. That was 35% of all the children in the London Education Authority. Now in the average grammar school of eight or nine hundred pupils, you probably have two sixth form classes taking physics with probably 20 to 25 pupils in each. And the point I'm making is that the concentrating the children with the most academic potential in a school is the most efficient and effective way of teaching those subjects. And the results which I gave you, that 164 grammar schools in those subjects were getting the same number of A and B results at A level as against 1,500, almost 10 to 1 comprehensives, tells you something about that. Now, the future of this country depends on its intellectual resources. It will not be able to compete with China, the States, or emerging markets, except it relies on its ideas and its education in the top subjects. Several years ago, a piece of research was carried out among those scientists and technologists and engineers 
at the cutting edge of research in their disciplines. 42% from independent schools, 48% from the grammar schools, and the remaining 10%, well, that's up to you to decide where they come from. Right. Uh, no, I think that's fine. Bless it. Oh, sorry, I thought that was addressed to him. Oh, gosh, so many things there. I didn't think you really, really addressed the question because I felt that what you were asking is why shouldn't other subjects be considered to have a similar, is it a value laden thing, how you decide what is a important or difficult subject. But I have to say that when Robert was talking, what I really thought was, it, he just keeps conveying a very old fashioned idea of comprehensive, not having anybody doing physics, not having good teachers. You know, I think by the time you get to do physics A level, whatever school you're at, you're gonna have people who are really good at physics and you hope you're gonna have really good teachers. And I think the point is, let's get the really good teachers into the schools that need it the most. I'm not saying grammar shouldn't have really good teachers, but I, I think that, that one of the, the good movements of the last few years has been about getting excellent teachers into schools where there are children who haven't been properly <coughs> taught before. So that seems to me very important. I just think Robert's got a very old-fashioned idea of homeschooling. I think things have changed enormously. And I think, and I, I certainly don't want it to go back, but I think it's improved a lot more than he realises. I think it's a brilliant question, and the reason we're still debating grammar schools that are, are dead, and comprehensive schools which various attempts have been made to assassinate, tells you that actually what we're debating is a struggle for knowledge, and who will own it, and who will control it, and which forms of knowledge are valuable. Physics, terribly difficult. History, that's a cinch. I could write a brilliant history essay because it's such an easy thing. Is it? What's specially difficult about physics if you've got that kind of brain? This is a struggle for knowledge and power in our society. Some people want to restrict it to a very narrow minority. Any other questions? schools deal, the grammar school debate deals with this, is always looking to the independent sector as if it's something to be encouraged and admired. I would like to see the independent sector shrink. I don't think we should support it through charitable status. I would like to see all children go to school together. Can, what, what do, do I think that the top 1% of somebody who's really, really bright in a subject can be taught well and flourish in a comprehensive setting? I do, yeah. I mean, the evidence from the international evidence is that if you treat all children as if they, what you've got to do is bring up the standard of those that you've written off to a higher standard. That's the evidence in Finland and Singapore. I mean, I think the Far East um, education systems are a little bit draconian for my liking, but I think the idea of high ambition for all is very, very important. So you're trying to bring everybody up. And I think there are all sorts of ways of taking someone who's particularly talented in one subject and helping them to flourish within a comprehensive setting. And as I say, by the time they get to GCSE and they get to sixth year, they'll be working with other people at the same level. But, you know, a creative school and a thoughtful school will see if someone's very talented. At my daughter's comprehensive, there was a young boy who was just brilliant at maths and is now, in your term, at top university at Cambridge doing maths. He flourished. He absolutely flourished. You know, he was made set extra work, he worked really hard, he did all his so-called hard subjects. I think it's possible. The trouble is, it's very difficult if you're always taking out the so-called bright and putting them in separate institutions. You know, if you go to a London school, you've got 20% going to the private sector, and then there are grammars dotted about. So you're talking about comprehensives that are actually depleted of the sort of talented and very able and ambitious people. I think that music is the really, really tough one for a comprehensive democratic society, because it requires massive investment. 
Uh, when, when my daughter's cello cost us two and a half thousand pounds at our comprehensive school, but I paid for it, it wasn't a surprise there weren't too many more cellists in the orchestra. So the, dis the money and wealth and education are not easily separated. What our system should be about is maximizing opportunity for all, not segregating a minority and giving them the goods. I take cricket as another example. Concrete pitches we had in the comprehensive system. How I envy those private school cricket witches, pitches, and I wouldn't want them dug up. But please, could more people use them? <laughs> well, now they will under Tristan Hunt. Right. Well, I don't know whether to be excited or really very disturbed. But we found something that I sort of be agree about. Oh dear, let's um, be worried. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to see the independent sector shrink. And you know when the independent sector in this country shrunk most? It was when we had state grammar schools across the country and great schools like Manchester Grammar School were available to everybody regardless of the ability to pay on the direct grant access scheme that we should bring back. And Melissa talks about Trafford as though it is Chelsea uh, or some uh, place of uniform affluence. Uh, you walk from the entrance of this building for probably less than a mile and you will get to Trafford. You will cross into Old Trafford and Stretford and you will see that the borough of Trafford actually is very socially mixed. It's got some very affluent bits and it's got some really quite deprived bits. The results we get, which are probably the best in the country, are across the whole of that borough. But the other thing which is really interesting, I think, uh, is that in that supposedly uh, uniformly affluent place, Trafford, the number of people going to independent schools is much, much less uh, than the numbers going in a borough like Stockport or in Bury or in Manchester City itself. The percentages would be roughly half as many. And I'm afraid that the fact is that if you give people choice, those people who can afford it will go private. If you don't, if you don't, sorry, if you don't give them a choice, those people who can afford it will go private and opt out. And that's not the result of Melissa Watson, it's not the result of why. The coming back to the question, uh, which I should be. Uh, uh, how can you offer that best education for the very best students? I think this is a real problem for comprehensive schools. And I'm not somebody who says you can't have good comprehensives. There are some good comprehensives. Typically, they are the most socially selective ones in the areas where uh, the uh, intake uh, has the most uh, advantages. Uh, not always. You can have some very good comprehensive schools. I think it is that much harder, unless you have an enormous school to provide the range of subjects and the range of different ability sets so that you can teach the child that's going to struggle uh, to get through GCSE maths and the person who's going to be going to a top university and um, maybe uh, going to be a professor of maths in the future. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. Uh, and all the evidence is you can pull it off better in a selective system. In three quarters of England, there are no grammar schools at all. The choice is therefore an independent school, a very good comprehensive school, or in the vast majority of cases, what Alistair Campbell described as a bog standard comprehensive school. If you are poor and socially disadvantaged in three quarters of the UK, you have no choice. You cannot, there's no grammar school, you cannot afford to go to an independent school and you cannot afford the house premium or postcode to go to the affluent comprehensive. And what does a parent in those circumstances do now? They send their child, potentially academic bright and able to the nearest possibly poor performing comprehensive. Now there are over three and a half thousand comprehensive schools in England. 
and the vast majority of them are of indifferent quality. But there are a number, but a relatively small number, that are of excellent quality. Why are they of excellent quality? Because the people, the parents, are generally aspirational. They use most of the ethos of the grammar school in that they internally stream they pick out, they select within the school the bright children and the not so bright children and they are screened accordingly. Will anyone convince me that an 11 year old who doesn't get the 11 plus and feels disappointed about it is likely to be any more vulnerable than the child in the comprehensive school that is streamed among those considered not so bright? The truth of the matter is that we are all born with different capacities, whether of an intellectual kind or a physical kind. As I explained once to uh, a, a, a classroom on this very point, the boy who at 15 weighs 16 stone and is 6 foot 3 or 4 may well play for England in a rugby union team, he's never going to ride a derby winner. And the eight stone boy who is alert and small and deaf may well write a derby winner, but he is never ever going to play in the front row for England. In 1945, Margaret Wilkinson, the first Labour education minister in the Adelaide government, made a speech and she made these very points. We must accept that different children have different capacities, both intellectually and physically, and we must provide the very, very best education for them according to their specific needs. But I am not arguing that there should be a general return to the old grammar school system of everybody having a high level test, a risk test at a level. But I am saying that there should be parental choice for the grammar school selective on merit, provided for those poorer children from poorer families an opportunity as I have. Now, I want to deal with Melissa. No, don't please, because I know what's going on. Well, just, just, well, just one quick point. The school that I went to did not have a single child who had a middle class parent. They were from the central back streets of Belfast. I could run them off. I didn't know any child whose father was a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant. We were all working class, all 800 of us. And I want a child in 2015 with a similar background to have the same opportunity as I had on merit. And your question was, should we have special schools, grammar schools, selective schools, for children who have specific talents and merit, the answer is yes. Thank you. Um, can I, can I yep. answer that? I mean, you know, your point about further maths teachers is a question about resources. It's nothing to do with selection. It's about schools, particularly schools in poorer areas, that just don't have the resources to teach people. So it's, it's nothing to do with it. If you'd have had a good further maths teacher, you'd have had a good further maths experience in a comprehensive. Um, so I, I just felt that was very important. The other thing to say is you can't have comprehensives and grammars side by side. The whole point of a comprehensive system, the whole point of the top performing systems internationally, is they just don't select children. They say, we are going to do the best for all of them. In this country, we're totally hung up on social class and everybody moving in through different classes and matching the independent sector. It's, a, it's the illness of the English. And actually, you go abroad and people say, all children are equal in value, everybody has talents, everybody can learn, people and children can specialise from 16 onwards. It's much more sensitive. But here, it's all about who you went to school, did you know a doctor, are you mixing with the right people, keep away from the poor. You know, we've got real problems. Oh,
I just think I've got to challenge this idea that somehow grammar schools have got brilliant teachers and all the rest in the comprehensives are crap. Quite honestly, that's grossly untrue and a terrible slander on teachers who are actually Ofsted, who's usually chasing teachers, find the vast majority of our comprehensive schools to be excellent. May I suggest to you that many of the teachers in grammar schools are refugees from the hoi polloi, <coughs> fearful of the lack of discipline that they'll have, can't handle ordinary kids or relate to them, and are looking for a secure and safe environment. I have taught in one of the top selective grammar schools in this country, and I've seen some terrible teaching there, including one maths teacher who wandered around the class in a daze, marking his own mark book instead of the student's work. <laughs> This, this proves nothing, but if we're going to hear, we're going to hear how terrible comprehensive schools are, essentially driven by ideological perspectives of a political kind, however unacknowledged, let us also recognise that there may just be a little poor teaching in every school. Well, all I can say is that Gordon Brown, these, these fabulous comprehensive schools, throughout the place. Gordon Brown threatened to close 640 of them a few years ago because they weren't managing to get 30% of their pupils, five GC, GCSEs, A star to C, including English and maths. And it was at that time that Alistair Campbell co coined that awful phrase, a bog standard comprehensive. And why is it, if there are such marvellous teachers in the comprehensive schools, are there so many disasters with many young teachers who try to control a class in an inner city comprehensive, giving up their teaching after a year or two? They simply can't stand the pressures of uncontrolled discipline, which has been brought about by the other aspect of comprehensive education the pernicious for not philosophy of child-centered education. That the teacher is no longer a person who teaches and exercises not discipline but authority because of his knowledge. He has become a facilitator, someone who stands to the side and doesn't, doesn't teach. He simply facilitates the child's nebulous voyage of self-discovery and <laughs> this, is the sort, this is the sort of progressive rubbish and nonsense that has been the cause of much of the failure of the comprehensive system which in its initial phase had a lot of true idealism about it but has failed miserably. I believe in freedom, I believe in choice. I don't think people should have to take whatever they're given. And so, like Robert, I wouldn't impose any particular model of education on any particular place. But the question of how do you find the balance, I would let communities find their own balance. At the moment, we have a situation everywhere that has grammar schools and has selection, they are immensely popular with the communities that they serve. And when there's been a balance arrangement to, that the Blair government put in place in 1998 to allow people to vote to get rid of it. Only one ballot has been held, and 75% of people voted to keep the grammar school in that instance. So you know, I would just trust people to make some decisions for themselves. Uh, what I would be tempted to do, if I was going to start the ball rolling, would be to put a few free state grammar schools back in our major urban centres, uh, places where all too often uh, the quality of state education isn't what it should be. And I think that would provide some opportunities for people at the moment, all too often have not. That is a very good question, because I am totally opposed to the domination of grammar schools by middle class parents who have money and who have their children coached. The reason for it, and how do we combat it, is we provide 
more grammar school places. It was a point I tried to make in my opening address that in Northern Ireland, 40% of the children post-primary go to grammar schools. Not 20%, 40%. Secondly, because the primary schools themselves uh, familiarize, coach if you like, all the pupils in the primary school whose parents wish them to do the selective test on the test, which minimizes to a huge degree the amount of private coaching. In other words, all the children start off who want to go to a grammar school with the same level playing field. And the only way you're going to deal with it in, in England is to open more grammar schools and stop that fearful competition <coughs> and coaching that goes on. Secondly, I think we've got to think about other methods of selection that obviate the coaching menace. And one of them is computer adaptive testing, which is used all over the world in a whole lot of other things, even to select people who are suitable for being astronauts. So it's a very sophisticated thing, but you would need the participation of the teachers in the primary schools. So most of the, the uh, criticisms of the grammar school system of selective education are not presenting insoluble problems. And we have solved most of them in Northern Ireland. Though we are under attack for ideological reasons from, from Sinn Féin uh, ministers of education. But that's the way to do it. Let me put it bluntly. If potatoes were as rare as truffles, you'd be paying the same price for them. And if grammar school places are made so rare, you are going to find outrageous competition. And money, as always, Will, and coaching will be a very, very big contributory factor. I agree with all of that, and I think the most disturbing thing in all of what you said was that in your primary school, only about five kids every year entered the exam, and more people should be given the opportunity. And just following from uh, Bob's comments there, uh, you know, I think, again, in Trafford, we select about 35% for the grammar schools. You compare that to the position in some of the remaining grammar schools in London, go to somewhere like Queen Elizabeth Barnett, and maybe somebody here who went to Queen Elizabeth Barnett, uh, if you did, you are very, very clever, uh, because the competition for those very few places has driven those schools to become hyper-selective. They're selecting maybe the top 1% of the ability, which maybe less than that. Uh, well, uh, provide some more places. Take the pressure out of the system. Uh, you don't have that crazy competition and parents going mad to get into the, the few schools that are available. When, when I did the 11 plus in Trafford at my primary school in Timford, uh, the headmaster came in and told us that we were going to be sitting three exams. He said two of them are going to be uh, practice tests and one is going to be the real one. But he wasn't going to tell us which order they were going to be in. Now, I'd like to think that even at the age of 10, I would have been bright enough to realize that the first two were the practice ones. And, but actually, there was no pressure in the system. As far as I can recall, everybody took the exam in my primary school, and we thought very little about it. And I would like to get back to that. Thank you. Bernard. What the questioner has opened for me is something which is missing from the debate. We've got a kind of sense from this debate of children having fixed abilities. There's some kind of genetic inheritance, IQ, bright kids, who get picked and then they do fantastic things. What the questioner has brought us back to is the immense learning ability of people. In the days when the university system was expanded, people said more means worse. You can't send this riffraff from the secondary modern schools to universities. We can't have 40% of the population going to the universities. They'll be illiterates. How can you let them write? They're not capable of it. That's what they said about higher education. Comprehensive schools and the expansion of higher education has given the ordinary people of this country the chance to walk as kings in their own country and not kowtow to the boss class who wants you back. I would say something just very quickly 
because I have a lot of things to say. I, the, um, none of us have talked about the importance of children's and different backgrounds and different experiences just going to school together. I mean, if you read about the history of grammar schools, and I'm sure it's still the case now, you're in primary school together, you live locally, you know each other, and then that's all divided up. Families get divided up. When people say to me they're moving to selective areas for the good schools, I say, what if one of your children fails? Well, of course, what the middle class do is pay for private education. But what about the idea of schools as centres of our democracy, as places where we learn about others who are very different from us? All the parts of education. No, you make, your, you make a face, and I've talked to you before the debate, I know what you think. But you can combine, you can combine an excellent academic education and a good social education. And grammars, that tripartite view, private schools, Grammars and the rest is just England at its worst. No, that's not so funny. So, unfortunately, we're very, very pressed for time, uh, so we can't have any more questions. But thank you very much for all of your wonderful questions today. Uh, so, now we're going to the session of the debate uh, where we have two minutes summary from each speaker. So, in the same order as before, I'd like to go to the party QC to give his summary of the debate. The question was asked from the floor how many people had gone to grammar schools and how many had gone to comprehensive schools. And clearly, just as the child is said to be father of the man, uh, the education may be, and your form of education may determine your outlook about the sort of education that you would like. But one thing I hope you have learned is that in every debate, there are two sides to the argument. And very often, each of them have much of value. And in this debate, I am certainly not arguing that we should go back and abolish all the comprehensive schools and, uh, uh, and go back to the old, everybody doing a, a grammar school selective test, and if you didn't get it, you went to a secondary model. What I am suggesting is that we should follow the principle of parental choice. You see, it seems to me that you can have uh, an academy, a comprehensive school, a faith school, a free school, a specialist school, but the one thing you cannot have in this democracy is a grammar school. Uh, all I am arguing for is that the grammar school form of education has virtues. It has virtues particularly for the academically inclined child. And that is something that is worth encouraging. And if we have more places by parental choice, then I think the whole broad scope of education in the United Kingdom would be improved. And I have indicated that Northern Ireland has cured many of the abuses attributed to selective education. Uh, it, enables people from the less advantaged uh, sections of the community to get to school and to get advantages. And I think that sort of pluralism in education is something worth voting for. The point I want to pick up at this stage with some considerable concern is the advocacy we've heard of the Northern Ireland system. Totally unlike the rest of the UK, but it exemplifies the danger of segregation. They may have segregation by ability, but they've also got segregation by faith. And that has had a lamentable consequence for the whole of Northern Ireland's recent history. And I'm not sure that we want to have segregation in England based on anything like it. We, we have the point from both Graham and Robert that selective schools are better now. But they're still selective. They impact, it's like the banker's effect on house prices. You set up a grammar school, you filter off 
teachers and parents and students who think they're getting something better and the effect on that area is planning blight and damage. The mirror of the successful grammar school are the schools that Robert quite rightly perhaps is lamenting. Why is the discipline poor in very, very poor schools? Because they come from housing estates that are mixed, where there's not a proper representation of the population, and where there is no scope for people to work together constructively. However, after a lifetime in comprehensive schools and visiting comprehensive schools, I've actually seen very little misbehaviour, and I've seen a lot of great learning. And I'd like to know Robert's sources of evidence for the contrary position.